China, a land as ancient as it is inscrutable, old as it is new. These faces today reflect the challenges which the Chinese people have confronted for centuries and more. The transformation of an ancient civilization into a modern one. A China that today reaffirms its commitment to communism, even as it is dismantled in much of the rest of the world. It cultivates anew the economic imperatives of free enterprise, while it retains the political structures of its more recent history. To understand China is to first glimpse and go back into some of that history. We're at the tomb of Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi, who was responsible for the political unification of China for the first time in 221 BC. Emperor Qin was a contemporary of Chandragupta Maurya in India. A harsh but pragmatic ruler, he was responsible for introducing a common script for China, for initiating economic reforms, and for the standardization of weights and measures. Emperor Qin also initiated the construction of the Great Wall. It was near these tombs in 1974 that excavations revealed the terracotta warriors. The earliest Chinese history disappears into the shadows of folklore and legend. The Chinese have traditionally claimed a history of 5,000 years. Yet legends tell us of mortal and celestial emperors who ruled China for tens of thousands of years before this. For hundreds, if not thousands of years, a fundamental tenet of Chinese political theory was the idea that heaven gives wise and virtuous leaders a mandate to rule and takes it away from those who aren't virtuous. A refinement of the mandate of heaven theory was the right to rebellion. The will of heaven is expressed through the people in their continuing support to the ruler or the withdrawal of that support. Justified rebellion exprenical rule. China, through much of its history, looked inward and was a land power, not a maritime nation. By the second century BC, a vocabulary had developed for dealing with foreigners. The barbarians, as they were called, were expected to come and be transformed by contact with the higher Chinese civilization. But Chinese superiority was to mellow, if briefly, with contacts with a southern neighbor. Historians are divided about the timings of the first contact between Indian and Chinese civilizations. There are references in the Mahabharat to the Chinas, or the Chinese. But there is little doubt that for 500 years from the first century AD, Buddhism, the most active religion in northern India, dominated the minds and the psyche of much of China. Buddhism traveled to China along the trade routes over the seas and came in from the northeast. We are at the Yungang Caves, about 200 kilometers north-northeast of Beijing. These caves were built 1,800 years ago, over a span of 40 years. Monasteries and temples sprang up everywhere in great numbers and these played a role similar to the churches and monasteries in medieval Europe. There were guest houses for travelers, hospitals, orphanages and refuges. The sculptors and artists of the Yungkang Caves were not imitative of Gandharvan art. Instead, they drew upon scriptural authority and looked upon their labors here as an accumulation of merit. That there was continuing interaction between India and China, the Buddhists between the two countries, is revealed by the fact that as the Hindu pantheon sought to absorb Buddhism and treated the Buddha as an incarnation of Vishnu, these caves too have statues of Vishnu in his incarnation as Kumarkadeva, 
with five heads and six arms riding a peacock. On the opposite wall is the statue of Shiva with its three heads and eight arms riding a bull. The Chinese deified the Buddha and Buddhist philosophy and metaphysics found the Chinese expression. A number of Buddhist texts, even today, are available only in Chinese translation. The best examples of these are in the case of the writings of Nagarjuna. These translations testify to the continuous and deep contacts between the Buddhist philosophical schools and the Chinese intelligentsia. No history of ancient India would be complete without a reference to the exchange between Indian and Chinese arts and philosophy. But through the cycles of history, these were so completely absorbed into the Chinese psyche that their origins were rarely, if ever, acknowledged and recognized by most Chinese. There are many, um, some basic concepts of, uh, about the cosmology or about uh, life actually developed, developed from the Buddhist, Buddhist ideas. But uh, uh, in the last, uh, in the many years, Buddhists uh, came to China, they have been transformed quite a lot. So now, the still we still can rec recognize some. For example, the concept of the rebirth and uh, uh, the karma, uh, you know, most of the Chinese believe it's actually the Chinese ideas. The, because they learned from their ancestors, but actually they came from the Buddhism. It was midway into the 20th century, as the bamboo curtain parted fleetingly, Avara and the films of Raj Kapoor and Indian dance touched popular Chinese culture and has remained a part of it. Could you give us an example of a mudra that is mm -hmm. used in Indian dance and in Chinese dance? Yes, uh, it's like this, huh? This is a uh, moon, huh? Half moon. Or in Chinese classic dance, we also do like this moon. Very similar. Mm. Uh, they are doing me. Huh? We also do like this. Same thing. Hmm. Uh, uh, something because maybe some uh, uh, how to say worried. Huh? We Chinese also like this. Same thing for show the mood. Many many things very similar. So Chinese people understand India dance very much. Between the 5th and 7th century BC was a time of great awakening in Asia. In India, we had Buddha and Mahavir, in China, Confucius. As it moved towards organized agriculture, new production relations developed. There was need for a philosophical structure to sustain the new economic systems. Confucius wrote the first systemized texts of social and moral philosophy and power. These became known as the Four Books and were to dominate Chinese philosophy and ideology to the mid-19th century when the West began knocking on its doors. Learning in China became learning these texts. Confucius shifted the emphasis of Chinese thought away from heaven and the supernatural and set it firmly down on earth, its people and the relationships between them. Confucius's impact on China has been immense.
Confucius was preceded by Taoism. The Taoists rejected self-assertiveness, competition and ambition. Nature was to be made friends with rather than controlled. The idea was to blend in harmony with the Tao, which flows through everything. The Taoists rejected all formalities, show and ceremony. The Confucians sought to arrange life within the framework of a meticulous code of conduct. Confucianism stresses social responsibility, while Taoism reveres spontaneity and naturalness. It was the Confucian worldview that eventually gained the upper ground in China. In the first act of Abhigyan of Shakuntalam, Kalidas's celebrated play, there is a reference to the silk cloth of the Shanta. It is referred to as China Chok, the Chinese cloth. Already in the Gupta times, the association of silk with China was part of the Indian psyche. China was not a distant country then, as it later became. The silk trade route, like other trade routes everywhere in the world, carried not only merchandise, but also ideas. From Japan and the East, the Arab world and Europe and the West, the Chinese traders and caravans traversed every corner of the then known world. If the impetus was commerce, the Chinese proverb that all men in the world bound by four seas are brothers is a testimony to the active intercourse with the outside world. It stimulated Chinese sciences and research. The Chinese were perhaps the first cartographers of the world. They also printed the first book. With the 18th century, the traffic of ideas starts flowing not from China, as much as through China. China, despite whatever one might have heard of Sinocentricism, has taken as much from the outside world as it has given to it. Though sea power became the major source of colonial dominance, the Silk Route was the vehicle of influences to and from China. The Forbidden City was the imperial quarter of China's last dynasty and was out of bounds for the common people. The 600 years during which the emperors ruled from here, the Chinese Empire fell from a high point of glory to the point of disgrace and disintegration. Towards the end of the 19th century, the state of the late Qing dynasty was no different from that of the late Mughals. The emperor's writ ran only so far as the gate of the Forbidden City. For the rest of the country, the emperor mattered to the extent his local satraps wanted him to. We are at the Forbidden City, an abiding symbol of traditional China in the heart of Beijing. It is from here that imperial power asserted itself for 600 years till the child emperor Pu Yi abdicated in February 1912. Soon after, a republican China was born under Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen died in 1925, and his successor, Chiang Kai-shek, was able to unite China for the first time under nationalist rule. He set up his capital in Nanjing. <laughs> The Republican Revolution, however, did not make the situation in China any better. Yan Shikai, who had prevented Sun Yat-sen from ruling in Beijing, tried to become an emperor himself, very much like Napoleon after the French Revolution. He was ambitious, but incompetent. Chiang Kai-shek unified China, but unification did not mean stability. Civil war, Japanese aggression, 
warlord autonomy, non-existent government, inflation, violence and death, marked the next 25 years in China. In the early 20th century, China was politically fragmented. The Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 catalyzed groups of young men all over China to form themselves secretly into groups. In 1921, under the inspiration of Professor Li Da Chao, a professor at Beijing University, eight young men here in Shanghai on this table formed themselves together into the Communist Party of China. Present was a young librarian clerk, his name Mao Tse Tung. By 1935, Mao had emerged as the undisputed leader of the Communist Party of China. While continuing to pay lip service to Russian communism and the international community of communists, Mao evolved a brand of Marxism uniquely Chinese, moving away from classical Marxism, which looked onto the worker as the instrument for revolution. Mao drew on the peasants instead. To Chiang Kai-shek, perhaps goes the credit of unifying China politically under the nationalist banner in 1928. But soon, there was a split with the communists. It was here in the Lishan Mountains in 1937 that the Shangxi warlord arrested Chiang Kai-shek and forced him to negotiate with the communists. This helped form a united front against the Japanese during the Second World War. But the relationship between the communists and the nationalists remained tenuous. It was in 1949 that it erupted with the formation of the People's Republic of China under the chairmanship of Mao Zedong. Chiang Kai-shek was forced to flee to Taiwan. The People's Republic of China was proclaimed formally on October the 1st, 1949, two years after Indian independence. The first truly October revolution was the Chinese Revolution. There is little doubt that the history of Asia changed with that event. In 1958, Mao Zedong initiated the Great Leap Forward. It was a strategy designed to leapfrog China from the primitive accumulation of capitalism to socialism and communism. At the core of the strategy was the creation of cellular units, urban and rural communes, with each unit generating its own capital goods and services. The initiative was particularly true of agriculture, where per capita productivity increased, as did the per unit utilization of land. But this was to soon reach a plateau. Even then, though China had 25% less arable land than India, its agricultural production was more than twice that of India. Villages in agriculture make up China. The communes made the economies of scale feasible. However, the per capita productivity has over the years been pushed to its limits. In a sense, a dead end had been reached. As in other developing countries, there is a rush for urban jobs. Organizational and institutional measures for increasing agricultural productivity have been exhausted. China has now turned to technological inputs. Cooperative agriculture has been worked to its limits. Hence, there is a new emphasis on personal initiative and technological change. Cash crops have acquired a new importance in the strategy and are probably responsible for making China a net importer of food. In olden times, I had no problem about what to plant and what to grow. Today, my family is responsible for our farm, and we decide what we should cultivate. I'm making more money today. The government has helped by increasing the supply of chemicals, fertilizers, and seeds, which are available at subsidized prices. China has always wanted to be a power nobody can play with. Nuclear weapons have been political weapons for that very reason. In the late 50s, 
when its Soviet allies turned down the Chinese plea for an independent nuclear deterrent, the Chinese turned to a nuclear weapons program of their own with a vengeance. 1964年10月16日,15時整,我國第一顆原子彈爆炸成功了。There was irony in the fact that the Chinese bomb went up in 1964 and Khrushchev went out of power in the same year. China's political history of the first three decades after the revolution has been marked by mass movements, but the biggest of such movements was the Cultural Revolution, which according to the Chinese lasted for a decade, 1966 to 1976. But by 1971, the major part of it was already consigned to history. The official view of the Cultural Revolution remains that it was a time of chaos and anarchy. But these were the years when new initiatives and foreign policy were taken. Nixon was to visit China during this very period, forging a crucial relationship between the two nations, though so ideologically divided and hostile to each other, was to last nearly two decades. The nuclear program, too, has gone on undisturbed during this decade of anarchy. Nevertheless, it was the time of mass movements of an unprecedented kind. It appeared at times that all rationality was being abandoned. The Red Guards were parading China's streets as if they were under a spell. The Red Book, the book of the quotations of Mao Zedong, was venerated as if it were a religious text. Mass fundamentalism flourished. Most fundamentalism turns violent at some stage. So did the Maoists. In 1967, Political opponents were treated like non-believers, executed. People who had given their life to the revolution rendered disorders. Members were tabulated by Deng Xiaoping. Confucius was branded as a philosopher of a slave society. That get well history must be wrong. The flights of revolution agitated failed in China. So did the space flight. Nothing seemed to go right. The Cultural Revolution was chaotic in the sense that it mistook romanticism for reality. A degree of hysteria set in. It was a small step then to failure. Chow and Lai was perhaps the most capable and the restraining influence on the excesses of the Maoist Revolution. Had he died after Mao, the history of China might have been different. Zhao Enlai was the most loved of the political leaders of China. Trained in Paris, he remained very Chinese to the core. There was little difference between him and his people. Mao Zedong was perhaps unlucky to have died as late as he did. He was already at the end of his influence and faculties. When he passed away, he could hardly speak. His trusted interpreters had to decipher what he had to say. Nevertheless, Mao's death of the children Chinese ended. 
He was the modern-day philosopher revolution. It is a lot of the philosophers to become redundant at some stage and be replaced by the pragmatic doers. This was the case with Mao as well. Deng was an inevitable, if not the logical consequence of Mao Zedong. The gang of four stood condemned by the name their successors had given them. The fate that the gang met was of course the same which they had imposed on their adversaries. No wonder then that the gang led by Mao Zedong's actress wife were condemned to death. Deng Xiaoping has remained the mystery of Chinese politics. He sought to prove Napoleon right, that the world would indeed be different when China wakes up. Since his return to power in 1978, he changed China's course as much and as firmly as the revolution in 1949 had. The return of Deng Xiaoping gave a new impetus to Chinese politics and the economy. The party congress put its seal of approval. The course seemed irreversible. The first task of purging the party of cultural revolution elements in it was complete. It was the moment of Deng's triumph. However, the more than a decade since then has not been an unmixed one. Deng and his policies still seem supreme, but that supremacy has not been without questions. Events have frequently moved faster than perhaps Deng Xiaoping himself anticipated. When that happens, it is usually difficult to permanently reverse the inexorable course of history. Like a legendary phoenix, Deng Xiaoping has risen time and again from his own ashes. There is no other leader in known communist history to have survived two disgraces and risen again, and that too to become the supreme leader. Here is a man who has not just made history, he is living history, even if now is the mysterious power behind the communist throne. In 1976, the year of the dragon, the most momentous events in China's recent history unfolded. In January, Chao Enlai died. In September, Mao Zedong. After a brief power struggle, Deng Xiaoping emerged the new leader of China. By 1977, after a decade of disorder and chaos, stability was restored to China. 
Today, Mao's embalmed body lies in state in the mausoleum on Tiananmen Square, and thousands of Chinese with a sprinkling of foreigners each day file past his body in reverential awe, in homage to the man whose life dominated a quarter of mankind for four decades. Deng Xiaoping had indeed performed some astonishing surgery, burying Mao's legacy of ideological ferment, disbanding his cherished communes, running roughshod over the People's Liberation Army, and reopening China's long closed doors to the outside world. Some of that legacy, at least today, seems partially revived again. Last year, 900,000 people visited Mao's birthplace, a record since the late 70s. Mao left behind a conveniently blank state psychologically. By the time the tenure detour into the political fantasy of the Cultural Revolution ended in 1976, the vast majority of Chinese was simply exhausted. There is poverty in China, like in any other third world country. The Chinese leadership is often at pains to emphasize that if China belongs to the third world, it is poised to become a major power by the next century. Their problems are similar to our own here in India. To feed a large population of over a billion people, to house them, to clothe them, to provide basic civic amenities to them, constitutes the overwhelming challenge. But with more than one billion people spread out from some of the biggest cities on earth to the Himalayas and the painful history of frequent plunges into uncertainty, the essential problem of governing China is simply maintaining political control. That cuts two ways. Were it not for Mao's highly effective totalitarian machinery, Deng could hardly have moved so fast or so far. In the spring of 1978, China's leadership announced four modernization programs, an economic development strategy that will provide the country with a powerful socialist economy by the year 2000. The modernization thrust was the focus on agriculture, industry, defense, and science and technology. Communist, socialist China began opening its arms in a cautious embrace of capitalist notions, such as private enterprise, economic incentives, and the pursuit to profit. A classless society was coming to terms with the pursuit of privilege. A vital component of China's economic strategy is the creation of special economic zones. These are intended to encourage foreign investment in industries that are primarily export-oriented. Foreign investors are drawn to special modern infrastructural facilities, liberal taxation laws, and the opportunity to repatriate their profits. In return, the Chinese earn foreign exchange, gain access to new technologies and modern management techniques. Since the opening of the economy in the late 1970s, more than 9,000 joint ventures have been concluded with foreign investors. 1985 imports rose by 88%. Exports by 1.5 percent. The trade deficit widened to 14 billion US dollars. By 1988, 10 years after its leaders initiated far-reaching economic reforms and greatly expanded ties with the outside world, major complications slowed their pace. Efforts to initiate wage and price reforms during the summer led to rapid inflation with the reimposition of stricter central economic controls. Rectification of the country's price structure had long been one of the most sensitive issues of the reform agenda. The leadership remained wary of abrupt action, especially after the inflation rate touched 20%. A more cautious approach to change was advocated by Premier Li Peng, 
his chief concern seemed to be stability and continuity under the guidance and direction of the central government. By 1990, the overall growth rate was down to 3%. The government austerity program and tight monetary policy reduced the inflation rate to 3.5%. The number of private businesses declined by nearly sixth from 14.5 million to 12.4 million. Many townships and rural enterprises shut down. In a shift away from its policies of liberalization, Beijing gave preference to reviving the state industrial sector by allocating billions of dollars for industrial loans and continuing the subsidies to inefficient enterprises. Profits and taxes from state-owned enterprises dropped by more than 20%. One-seventh of state revenues went to subsidize grain to consumers. But China managed a trade surplus of 13 billion US dollars with the United States alone. If music corrupts, then Western popular music corrupts absolutely. Or so the cultural commissar implied in his 1982 book, how to recognize pornographic music, in which he warned that Western music provokes the nerves. It is a tribute that the taste of young Chinese has not been inhibited, even if it is a few years behind the West. Traditional Chinese clothes are impractical in modern China. Young people today are exposed to Western concepts, so it is only natural that they should want to wear Western clothes. Everyone wants to look beautiful and attractive, so our ideas of personal beauty are also changing. So makeup, perfumes, and hairstyles are inspired by West. While it is true that Western fashions are making an impact, in China today, we must recognize that it is an inevitable process. Even the Mao suit worn so widely not long ago by both men and women was imported into China by Sun Yat-chen from Japan. There's no slowing down the pace of reforms in China. The speed of economic growth has been very rapid, faster than our structures have been able to deal with. We are exploring measures to control further the pattern of economic reform and so regulate the overheating of the economy. We are firmly committed to deepening reform and following the new order of economic construction, promoting the system of shared profits and affording collaborations. The Marxist dictum of Mao's China was each individual according to his capacity to his needs. In the post-revolutionary China of Deng Xiaoping, there is a growing emphasis on the each according to his capacity. The pursuit of individual excellence is no longer disparaged as the pursuit of elitism. We're here at the Children's Palace in Shanghai, where 1,500 children between the ages of 6 and 16 with unique talents are selected through a rigorous examination procedure for special nurturing. They are trained in areas diverse as traditional Chinese music, the piano, calligraphy, and computers. Here, indeed, are the building blocks of China's future.
After only a few years of experimentation, it became obvious to party leaders that with the emphasis on economic life, the authority of the party seemed to be weakening. Deng Xiaoping himself has often proclaimed the need for political reform, but he invoked the four cardinal principles. Adherence to the socialist road, the people's democratic dictatorship, leadership by the Communist Party, and Marxist-Leninist-Maoist thought to define the boundaries of acceptable political action. China's democratic debate has been shaped by its historical and philosophical evolution, where participation has always been a crucial concept, even if a participation without influence. How effective and efficient do you think the induction of Western capitalism can be in China, uh, given that it is, it, is, it is a strategy born and bred in the context of Western liberal democracy, uh, which isn't uh, the, the form of democracy that, that is practiced in contemporary China? I think it's a, a, uh, it's a question of time, gradually, from lowest level to, I mean, to district, maybe, we will have something like uh, your uh, general elections, but not now. Uh, but I'm not an expert on political system. But in my own opinion, I think a uh, democratic uh, process in China will be gradually improved. To what extent, uh, I have no idea, but I hope for myself. I hope this process will be faster because I'm now in my old age, yeah, I will, uh, I mean, uh, see that change, and yeah, say, within 10 years or so. So I am for the democracy uh, and uh, the socialist system. As China reaches out to external ideas and influences while resurrecting some of its own, it confronts the challenges and problems of development similar to what we do in India. There is now smog in Canton and prostitution in Chinese ports, and corruption has raised its ugly head. The Chinese government in Chiangai alone has set up 24 reception centers, such as this one, where citizens can file complaints against government officials for corruption. Since June this year, 6,000 cases have been filed, 250 ferreted out for investigation, there have been 50 cases initiated, and 60 people have fessed to their crime. In the words of Deng Xiaoping, you open the word window for fresh air, you are bound to lend some insects. Extensive contacts and cooperation among nations and increased interchanges and understanding between peoples will make the world we live in more safe, more stable, and more peaceful. Ideological differences and border disputes had long divided the two most powerful communist nations. Mikhail Gorbachev initiated a bold recasting of Soviet global and strategic policy, a response in tune with the Chinese imperatives of putting economic and technological development on top of the agenda. The long-awaited Sino-Soviet summit was held in the summer of 1989. The visit served the important symbolic purpose of ending the long-standing Sino-Soviet conflict amid affirmations of mutual friendship and respect for the principles of sovereignty and non-intervention in each other's internal affairs. Since then, Chinese leaders have watched in tight-lipped dismay as communist governments have collapsed in Eastern Europe. Premier Li Pang has dismissed the notion that Soviet-style reforms were also applicable in China. During a visit to the Soviet Union in April 1990, he laid a wreath at Lenin's mausoleum, indicating his fidelity to that orthodoxy. The present changes has added to our confidence that China has embarked on a very correct route of uh, socialism with the Chinese characteristics. You know, uh, during the past several years, of course, as you have said, there have been so drastic changes. But uh, as far as I can see, you know, this is actually a result, I mean, the present difficult position of, you know, our friendly country like the Soviet Union and East, or the East European countries, actually is the result of the deviation from socialism. So, and this deviation has not led to a better situation. On the contrary, it is leading us into a very, you know, difficult position of theirs. 
So in this case, on the contrary, I think the present situation in China, both political and economic and social, are very good. Of course, we still have uh, some uh, difficulties, but uh, we are quite confident that we can overcome these difficulties. Still looking at it essentially as, as uh, changes of economic system. Well, it involves changes of economic system, but essentially it is a revolt against certain kind of certain kind of political structure, a certain kind of kind of state collapsing. And I think the Chinese, that has put Chinese ex, uh, uh, analysts of these developments um, uh, um, uh, in, in a position where they are now defending the Chinese state structure with a greater enthusiasm and greater strength, as it were. They think that, well, yes, our, uh, our state structure will not collapse. Relations with the United States began to change way back in 1971-72 when Kissinger and Nixon visited China and met with Mao Zedong. Following the Nixon-Mao meetings, there was a second fillip to Sino-American relations with Deng Xiaoping's visit to the United States. American businesses, however, which had anticipated access to huge profits from large Chinese markets, were soon to be disappointed. Expect that normalization will help to move us together toward a world of diversity and of peace. For too long, our two peoples were cut off from one another. Now we share the prospect of a fresh flow of commerce, ideas, and people which will benefit both our countries. But the honeymoon was to end in the summer of 1989 with the events in Tiananmen Square. Stung by U.S. congressional criticism of human rights abuses, Chinese leaders strenuously denounced U.S. intervention in Chinese internal affairs. For well, our human rights problem, I think our position is very clear. You know, we have recently actually issued a white paper on our human rights I mean, position. And uh, in this respect, of, of course, I think we have to judge this human rights position, you know, uh, from, I mean, the, uh, the relevant co country's perspective. For instance, we have our own social system. It is different from the Western countries. And you know the Chinese history, especially the re history, uh, I mean, in this century. So we are very happy about our own human rights position. And for Indians, of course, it is for the Indian people <laughs> to make appraisal. So I think it is not good for any other country to say anything on other countries' human rights problem. The Tiananmen movement collapsed because of severe action they took, but it was confined only to Beijing and the cities. The countryside in China did not back the pro-democratic movement. That is why in the latest meeting of the plenum of the Central Committee, they saw to it, they take more steps to appease the countryside. They want to keep the political power intact by appeasing the countryside. So their emphasis, renewed emphasis on agricultural development probably can be explained in this political terms. Secondly, they are going to organize a party congress, I am told, towards the end of 1992. Now, the Xi is certainly old. Some of the other leaders are very old. That planning could be decisive. It's possible the older generation at that time may pass on the baton to the younger leaders. Or, at that, that Congress, the leadership question may, 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 may come to the fore in more, uh, more demonstrative forms. China has largely succeeded in overcoming its international isolation following Tiananmen. British Prime Minister John Major became the first Western head of state to visit Beijing in more than two years. Prime Minister Li Pang reminded Mr. Major that his country had not forgotten being humiliated and bullied in the past by Western intruders. Uh, about the Tiananmen Square, I think uh, our position has been very clear. I think we have several I mean, statements already, so I think this is well known to all of you. And about uh, the pressure, as uh, mentioned by you, I think uh, for now it is already how many years? Already more than two years, I think after that. And uh, I think uh, it has been proved that this pressure will lead to nowhere. So I'm very happy to find that uh, this year there have been changes. 
So there have been, has, have been some kind of restoration of high level contacts between China and other Western countries. The United States Secretary of State, Jim Baker, went to Beijing in November 1991. Meanwhile, China had scored two major diplomatic victories. Saudi Arabia broke relations with Taiwan and forged them with China instead. China and Indonesia resumed diplomatic relations which had remained suspended for 23 years. China played a constructive role in ending the conflict in Cambodia. President Bush had earlier succeeded in derailing an attempt by the United States Congress to deprive China of most favored nation status because of its perceived human rights abuses. The haunting melody of Raj Kapoor's film, Avada, is still heard and remembered in China. Indian films dubbed in Chinese are not rare. Our cinema, with its emphasis on the narrative, gets across easily to Chinese audiences. Rarely in human history have two people so comparable in terms of civilization and in their striving for modernity sought a dialogue, a working, amicable relationship with each other, a relationship that strained with the war in 1962, was in a sort of hole for more than 25 years till the visit of Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi to China in December 1989. Uh, what Rajiv Gandhi uh, did was a couple of steps forward, uh, largely because once again he tried to put it back into, uh, into the total framework of India's foreign policy, not to relate it necessarily to South Asian politics or Southeast Asian politics uh, individually, but to view it as a, a more, as a, more as a matter of, uh, matter of uh, overall in foreign policy, overall world view of India. Two great civilizations confront a historic opportunity. Prime Minister Li Peng has arrived in India on a five-day state visit. The first Chinese Prime Minister to do so in more than 30 years. He followed in the footsteps of his foster father, Chiang Lai. While no one expects a resurrection of the old hindi Chini Bhai Bhai, both nations can look forward to a more mature relationship based on a commitment to and an understanding of what unites the two countries rather than divides us. Globally, there are many issues on which we can cooperate. In fact, some of the issues cry out for cooperation between India and China. One is the north-south question. And I think India and China alone, by cooperation, can put meaning as well as a degree of urgency to this important divide in the world and to find a solution to that. And the second thing is what we normally talk as South-South cooperation, which has become desperately important in order to establish some balance, some equitable position between the developed North and the developing South. India and China can be catalytic agents in making this cooperation more realistic, more substantial and meaningful. There is one consensus which can one, uh, one safely uh, notice that there's a need to improve relations with China. I think on that there is consensus. On what term the improvement should be, should be brought about, on that there can be difference of opinion. Since the revolution of 1949, the Chinese people have been with to the booming flowers, the great leap forward, the cultural revolution, the Gang of Four, the Four Modernizations, periods of sudden and bewildering change. As China reaches out to the outside world for political and economic influence, it is a China we cannot ignore. Oh,